You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode 78, From Anti-Catholicism to Apostolic Christianity, with my friend Sam Shamoon. Uh, guys, before we jump into tonight's exciting episode, which I'm thrilled to be a part of, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. First of all, I want to thank my official sponsor, Havana Palace on Huron Church Road in Windsor, Ontario. For the best service, finest cigars, go see Caesar and Eli. They treat all their customers like family. If you would be so kind as to go to facebook.com slash Havana Palace, give their page a like. I would greatly appreciate it. Right now, I'm enjoying their brand new house blend, uh, Nicaraguan Cuban Seed. Very delicious, along with an adult beverage. I hope it doesn't offend anybody. Um, It's actually helping the sinuses because unfortunately, myself and my family have contracted COVID, but by the grace of God, we're we're doing all right. It's not not that bad. Um, But uh, yeah, God, God willing, everything will turn out just fine. I didn't want to miss this episode, so I'm not going to let COVID stop me. Uh, Second of all, very exciting news. Um, Through a website called smartcatholics.com, I just released yesterday an online course with the help of my friend Dominic D'Souza of Smart Catholics. It's called The Hebrew Origins of Catholicism. So if you're at all interested, you can go to smartcatholics.com slash Dustin Quick. There you can find a short interview with me. It's basically my bio, my conversion story. And if you click on courses at the top of the page, you'll be able to access that. And basically what I show through interviews with the likes of Dr. Margaret Barker, uh, Dr. John Bergsma, Swan Sona, and Daniel Suazo, a.k.a. the Jewish Catholic on YouTube, we show how the Catholic Church is the restoration and fulfillment of the first temple in Jerusalem and the Davidic kingdom. So if you're at all interested in how that plays out, everything from the Eucharist to the liturgy to the papacy to Mariology, you can go check that out. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. 12 lessons in all. It's free. Enjoy it. I just want to share the good news with everybody. All right, guys, with that out of the way, uh, I have the legend here with me, Brother (laughs) Sam Shamoon. Sam, how are you doing this evening? Glory to the Chime God. I just want to say one thing. I, too, appreciate prayers guys pray for my brother dustin pray for me pray god will grant his family full recovery but pray for me the lord jesus keeps me perfectly healthy and fit especially my daughters because i feel a little under the weather but i can't afford covid unless the lord jesus wants me to go through it to build up my immune system because i'm basically by myself here that means i have to care for myself so i trust the great physician by the blood of jesus the flesh of jesus christ our lord Ask the Lord to bless my brother's family, full recovery, and me to stay healthy and fit for the glory of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Now, brother, you got me excited about those series. I have to make it intentional to study because part of the testimony will be that I'm almost 50 years old. In fact, I got a shirt. I bought two shirts. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. It's not online. September 1972, right? That's because it says 50, I think. Does it say 50? Anyway, I have two of them. Because Lord Jesus willing, if the Lord is pleased to extend my earthly life, September 14, I'll be 50, half a century old. Wow. So I have to learn a lot of things, unlearn a lot of things, and Mm -hmm. relearn a lot of things. So this is all new to me. So I want to learn from the best available evidence. And I just want your feedback before we begin. Because as I'm now interacting with these various ancient apostolic traditions and Mm -hmm. brothers and sisters and Lord Jesus Christ who love the Bible, love the ancient church, I have noticed that there is a division and a debate among Orthodox and Catholics. So when you said, for example, the papacy is ancient and biblical, that does not mean that those Orthodox who think otherwise, you don't consider them to be enemies, right? I just want people to understand. Of course not. Your view is that they are brothers in Christ. You are the two lungs of the church, the Eastern and Western lung. But as siblings, there's some rivalry, right? Yeah, there is. Uh, You know, it's like the parents are divorced and the siblings fight, but we have a lot in common, right? Uh, The view of the Catholic Church officially, magisterially, is that they are our sister churches. And in fact, our canon law allows an Orthodox person, if they're properly disposed, to receive the sacraments or the sacrament of the Eucharist in a Catholic church. So we extend that grace to them and they are our brothers and sisters in Christ most definitely. And we share 
the most uh, uh, you know in, in common with them relative the, to the other christian uh, ecclesial bodies out there so yeah definitely our sister churches glory to the trying god so brother i'm here to serve you by the grace of jesus christ so we invoke in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in the matchless name of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, I ask the Holy Spirit to anoint you and me, to bless your family, to bless my daughters. And may the Holy Spirit guide this conversation, save me from error and stammering, and enable me to recall the facts of my journey for the sole purpose of magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ and building His church. And may the Lord always shine in and through you and your family, always, forever. And may He seal us and keep us faithful to Jesus Christ our Lord, until the Lord summons us or until he returns, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in the name of our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, brother, someone's asking a question. What kind of cigar you smoke? And why do you smoke cigars, brother? Uh, this question again, which we dealt with on your stream last time. Well, I'm going to keep it short and sweet as possible because I don't want to detract from what me and Sam are about to discuss. But uh, why I smoke cigars? Uh Cigarettes have like 400 plus chemicals in them. Quality cigars just have tobacco. Tobacco has been used by various cultures for millennia for various purposes, even medicinal. Um, I find it like almost like a ritual, relaxing while I do it. Sometimes I, well, a lot of the times I actually pray the rosary, listen to an edifying podcast or YouTube video about the faith, about the mysteries of our faith, uh, about the triune God, what have you. And uh, I enjoy it. And there is a study on uh, that I saw from the FDA comparing uh, cancer rates between non-smokers, cigarette smokers, and cigar smokers. And there's a little section tucked away in there that says, in moderation, which is one to two cigars a day, there's no statistical significant difference in terms of cancer rates between non-smokers and cigar smokers in moderation. Now, there are some caveats, one being, depending on what you drink with a cigar. Now, if you drink alcohol, which a lot of people do, which admittedly I'm doing tonight, but uh, it, it actually kills some of the protective mucous membranes in your mouth, making you more susceptible to like, you know, diseases of the mouth and that kind of thing. But if you drink, say like a warm coffee, that mucous membrane is maintained and protected. So I'm not encouraging anybody to, to pick up a cigar or a pipe if they don't want to, but if they feel so inclined, hey, that's your liberty as a child of God. Romans 14, as long as your brother or sister doesn't stumble, then it's all good. Do what you do. Any, everything in moderation. Because you know what? Drinking and eating too much sugar can be just as bad, if not worse. So everything in moderation. I, I'm an, and again, in fact, with that said, what, two of my vices, and I need your prayers, saints, because you guys, if you've been following me, you see I emphasize and beseech the brothers to pray because the Bible says God delights in the prayers of the righteous, those who yield to the Spirit. And mortify their flesh your prayers are his delight and god acts upon the prayers of his beloved so pray because my two vices food addiction i'm a food addict glutton and as well as lustful desires so pray in the almighty matchless name of the triune god father sony spirit he gives me perfect victory in those areas so tell me about it gluttony overeating can be a sin so Absolutely. anyway brother i'm here to serve you all right well, uh, and if somebody asked me what kind of cigar this was, it's a Havana Palace House Blend, and it's a, a Nicaraguan Cuban seed. That's what I'm having. My favorite of all time is from a brand called My Father's Cigars, and it's La Flor de las Antillas. That's the pronunciation. That's my favorite. It's about 20 bucks Canadian, 10 bucks US. La all right, y'all. Does that uh, mean flower? Yeah, flower, yeah. Because I, I used to listen to, not listen, I watched the movie on Selena who tragically died, she was murdered, mm. and she had a song, Como la flor. Yeah, flower, yeah, exactly. Como la flor. Now, just to let you know about Selena, she used to sing what's going as Tex-Mex music. Mm. She got gunned down by this, by the president of her fan club, a woman that was really psycho. The reason why she died is because her family shows witnesses, and they refused to allow her to take a blood transfusion. They would prefer her to die than to take blood transfusion because many people don't know that the Jehovah Witnesses, their society, due to their perverse understanding of scripture, not only say you shouldn't eat blood, which is forbidden, meaning mm. animal blood, but they they say that if you inject blood, that's like a form of eating. So she died. Oh, that's tragic. Yeah. Yeah, all because of a misunderstanding and misapplication of scripture, right? Yep. It's a very deadly thing. I mean, I, and I think we're going to, unpack some of that tonight along the way hopefully all right so my friend uh 
before we get into like the nitty gritty, I just want to know, uh, what was life like growing up for you? Um, early life, early experience with the Christian faith. Uh, tell me some about that. Yes. Uh, so like I said, I'm going to be 50 September 14. That means I was born 1972. So people can know a little bit about my background. I'm Assyrian. I have to say the ah, because if I say it fast, people think that I'm Syrian from Syria. I am not Syrian. I'm not from Syria. I'm Assyrian, which is the anglicized way of saying an Ashuraya, a son of Asher. Because we believe the Bible's accurate history, if you read Genesis 10 and 11, you'll see the genealogies of the three sons of Noah. Shem had one son named Ashur. So the sons of Ashur are Ashurai, sons of Ashur. That's what I am, an Assyrian, a son of Ashur, ethnically. And so I was born in Kuwait, but my family left shortly after I was born in Kuwait, and they eventually settled in Chicago, Illinois. So pretty much since 1974, I've been a Chicagoan all my life. Now, I'm not in Chicago anymore due to circumstances, and if the Lord's will be done, we'll talk about that. That's made the spirit lead. So as an Assyrian, and by the way, the Chaldean Assyrian, they're one community. We're one. Okay. Assyrian Chaldean, they were one community. They called themselves Chaldean, but were the same blood, same group. Mm. One primary reason why they're identified as Chaldeans is to distinguish them from the ancient Assyrian church, which is labeled Nestorian. Maybe we right. can get into that as well. Uh -huh. Chaldeans are Catholic. They belong to the Catholic church. The Assyrians typically would be those who belong to what's called the Nestorian churches, right? right? So my upbringing was, quote unquote, Nestorian. The problem with that is, though, my parents were ignorant of theology, ignorant of scripture, ignorant of their faith. So I was ignorant of my faith. So although my background is Assyrian, quote unquote, Nestorian, they never taught me about Christianity, never taught me about the Bible, never ta taught me about the church. I do remember going to the Assyrian churches in Chicago, mm -hmm. but that was maybe once in a while. They'd take me on Sunday or big days, but I had no clue what the Christian faith was until I was around six and a half years old. But just, just in a nutshell, that's my background. Okay. So uh, what happened around six? Well, God's providence. I ran into a family from Lebanon. But this family, though they were from Lebanon, they're Assyrian as well. They're Assyrian, Lebanese Assyrians. Two brothers and their grandmother. The grandmother's name, Shmuni. She was a very devout Catholic lady. Now, don't, don't forget, I don't know what Catholic is, what Nestorian is. I don't know any of this stuff. I'm too young. Right. Didn't even know the Christian faith. I find this out later on. As I start understanding, then I realize so she was a devout Catholic. Her grandsons, the sons of her daughter, were now under her care because in Lebanon, th these two brothers, their mother had died when they were young. I guess she was delivering and she died with the baby. And pretty much their father abandoned them to the grandmother, their maternal grandmother, to raise them. So the youngest of the two, his name was Raymond Malco. So around the age of six and a half years old, this young man, at the age of nine, he was a couple years older than me, he was about nine, he knew his Bible because not only did his grandmother teach him the faith, it turned out that his uncle, his grandmother's son, his mother's brother, so we're talking about maternal, this is all on his mother's side, right. had become a devout evangelical. I didn't know this. I'm finding this out later. His name was John. So he learned two traditions, the Catholic tradition and the evangelical tradition, but he leaned more at that young age towards the evangelical tradition due to the influence of his uncle John. Right. And so he met me and I was a very problematic youth. I, I was uh, very disrespectful, unruly, right? I'm the youngest of six, four boys, two girls, and I'm the youngest. The oldest is a boy and I'm the youngest, two girls, four boys, very unruly. My dad wasn't around to discipline me. My mother was one of those old fashioned women that wasn't really educated. So my upbringing was I was wild, unruly. So when I first met him, I was very disrespectful as I was to everyone at that age. Even at that, young, at that age, I was a punk. But he kept pursuing me and kept persisting. 
And then finally, I gave him a hearing, and he presented the gospel of Jesus Christ, a nine-year-old named Raymond Malco, whom I still know, and I saw him not too long ago. He's now grown. He's married. He's got his own children, three children. God bless them all. But he's not actively involved in ministry. He works a full-time job, but he still believes. Sure. But it's ironic, right? Go ahead, brother. You're saying something. Oh, no. It's just uh, Is he still evangelical? I would say that he leans more evangelical, but he's open to the Catholic Church and Orthodox. He's not anti-Catholic or anti-Orthodox. He doesn't bash. But right, okay. he feels more comfortable in evangelicalism because he follows the Bible alone, Sola Scriptura. Sure, right. sure. So he, at that age, he's nine, I'm six and a half, he introduced me to the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. Now, mind you, though I was raised in a Christian home, I didn't know who Jesus was. I was raised in a Christian home, but I didn't know who Jesus was because my family were Christian by name. They didn't feel it important enough to tell me about Christianity. They didn't even feel it important enough to tell me that in the Middle East, the majority of people are Muslims and they follow Islam. I didn't learn any of this from my family, even though my family's from originally parents from Iraq. Though I was born in Kuwait, my father settled there. None of this was told to me. No one told me about Islam or Muslims. And they definitely didn't tell me who Jesus was. I learned this from a nine-year-old boy when I was around six and a half years old, around the year 1979, in Chicago, Illinois. And he told me, Jesus, Son of God, who loved me enough to die for my sins on the cross, and I needed to have a relationship with Jesus. And he also told me the sinner's prayer. See, later on, I found out what this was. At that right. time, I didn't know. And for those of you who don't know the sinner's prayer, because his uncle was not just an evangelical, he was a Baptist, right? Protestant, Baptist, evangelical, even though Baptists don't like to call themselves evangelical. So they follow what's called the Romans road to salvation and the sinner's prayer. Say this prayer, which is something you'll find in Baptist churches and evangelical churches, where you pray to receive Jesus into your heart. So he taught me that prayer. So at the age of six and a half, I went home, tried to remember that prayer and cried on to Jesus to enter my life. And overnight, my life was changed, and he took me under his wing. He was nine. He had an older brother named Elias, who was two years older than him, around 11. So the grandmother taught him and me prayers, and he would teach me the Bible. Believe it or not, he also did street evangelism. And there are people now who still know me who can confirm that in the 70s and 80s, we would go out in the Chicagoland area, in the north side, Andersonville. For those of you who know Chicago, Andersonville, it's located in the north side. It's Foster, Clark Street, Ashland, right? Anyway, he would go out there, and I'd follow him. I wasn't the speaker because I didn't know anything. And he would preach, and we would draw crowds. I'm not exaggerating. We would have dozens, in fact, up to hundreds surrounding us on Clark Street because they were blown away that a nine-year-old would preach the gospel boldly. And I would just stand there next to him. Okay. And this became pretty much my upbringing for several years until he relocated. And that's where I was introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me add one more element, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, the mother, the grandmother, because he called her mother, because that was the only mother he, he knew, but it was really his grandmother, taught me prayers and taught me the Ave Maria. I pretty much got influenced by Baptist theology. And this is another element that's important to add to my testimony. During that time, there was a bus service that would come out from Hammond, Indiana. Guys, if you don't know the area, just go to Google. Hammond, Indiana is not too far away from Chicago, Illinois. There's a church that's still active. It's called First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. The pastor at that time was Pastor Jack Hiles. He was an independent fundamentalist, fundamental Baptist, IFB, independent fundamental Baptist. He even has a college named in, named after him, Hiles Anderson College, but it teaches Baptist theology. So right. during this time, the they would send out yellow buses to pick up people from the cities, take them to that huge church in Hammond, Indiana, First Baptist Church, and they would teach you Baptist theology. And in Baptist theology, it's easy believism. If you say that prayer, once saved, always saved. It's actually easy believes them. You can even walk away. But if you said that prayer, doesn't matter how you live. At the end, Jesus will forgive you because you said that prayer. So it's basically easy believism. And pretty much sola scriptura. And in particular, the King James Version. 
So this was my influence. I was not influenced by Catholic theology or even quote unquote Nestorian. Assyrian. No, it was Baptist theology. Yeah. And that was what affected me later on in my life when I returned. Okay, so you said you returned. So there must have been a falling away. What oh, sort yeah. of what were the circumstances that precipitated you falling away and describe that period in your life? Sadly, like most people, I was raised in a broken home. Uh, my my dad, sadly, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but it's part of my testimony. Sadly, was a womanizer and alcoholic, was not faithful to my my mother, and my mother was fed up with it. So around when I got to, to be the age of seven, after I got to know who the Lord was, she said, I'm done. She left the house, but then my dad saw that I was crying. So he said, look, let her come back and I will leave because she was tired of his womanizing. So my anchor at that time, at the age of seven, was the Lord Jesus using Raymond Elko and his grandmother to teach me the faith and going to Hammond, Indiana. So I wasn't unruly, but then years later, Raymond relocated. His, his grandmother, him and his brother relocated. So I didn't have big brother to disciple me. So I started just hanging out with all the kids in the neighborhood. And by the time I became a teenager, I pretty much just gave up on the faith. And the reason why is when my dad left when I was seven, he came back years later for a short while and left again because he didn't repent of his womanizing ways. And my mother and him didn't see eye to eye. And during this time, my dad's younger brother, Jericho, his name was Jericho. He became more of a father figure to me than my dad. And he died in the 80s of cancer. I believe he was 42 years old. He was in his 40s, very young, and he died of cancer. And that left the hole. So, again, my dad coming back, leaving, and my uncle dying of cancer because I loved him. I looked to him more than I did my dad, who was not there, would pay lip service. So that left a hole, and I didn't have Raymond. And my mom was too busy getting up 5 in the morning taking two buses to try to go to downtown Chicago to work as a maid in Sheridan Plaza in that freezing cold weather. And then by the time she get home, it would be probably five, six o'clock in the evening. So pretty much I didn't have that influence anymore of Raymond and mm -hmm. his grandmother. So went into the street. By the time I was 12, 13, I just gave up on the Christian faith. And I thought, maybe, you know what, maybe it's, this is all a hoax. Yeah. And it didn't help that even Raymond later on, due to Charles Darwin, because he was a very intelligent young man and read. And even at that age, he was two years my senior, started reading Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species and pretty much became an atheist. Really? Oh, yeah. I, I, and remember, I'm, I'm probably around 11. He's probably 13. He's already reading. That's how intelligent, how sharp of a mind he had. Origins of Species. And he said, ah. The Bible is all bunk and God doesn't exist. And I'm like, wow, the guy who influenced me, yeah. who I looked up to, wow, man. I said, hey, man, it's bunk. So in my teenage years, I started sadly doing what many boys raised in the streets in the city do. I started drinking at that young age, started smoking cigarettes. And sadly, I started smoking marijuana. But it stopped there. Now, had the Lord not intervened, sadly, these drugs are a gateway to harder forms of drugs. So the next step would have been cocaine because in the 80s, yeah, it was cocaine. Glory to God, God stopped me. I didn't take it that far. And sadly, others took it further. And even one of my friends, childhood friend, and in fact, ironically, if you look at the comment section, you see that man, Thomas? Yeah. See him. He, let me just tell you something about Thomas. He's about a few years younger than me. He grew up in the same neighborhood. So everything I'm telling you, he can, will confirm. He's a witness. Mm. And I love him as my younger brother. He's hey, dear Thomas. to my heart. So I love Thomas. I love his family. I love his mother. We grew up together. It's like when I see him, it's my family. Not right. just spiritually because he loves Jesus, but I see him as my younger brother. It's his older brother that I was more close to growing up because he's younger. But he can confirm all what I'm saying. And this story he can confirm because this young man that was my friend, his younger brother is Thomas's, one of Thomas's best friends. I won't mention his name. He ended up going into harder form of drugs. And about in the year 2000, 2001, he died of a heroin overdose. Well, not a overdose. I'm sorry. He died because the particular heroin, from what I was told that he took, 
wasn't cut. Sorry to guys to get too technical. So it was very deadly and it killed him dead and left another friend of mine in a coma for months, but he survived. Wow. But that would have been my path. Now, how did God stop me from getting to that point? Mm -hmm. How did God stop me? Well, see, the Lord is amazing. During the 90s, my brother started getting into bodybuilding. And my first cousin started getting into bodybuilding. And for those of you who don't know because you're younger than me, one of the biggest names in bodybuilding wasn't just Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was Sergio Olivia. Sergio Olivia. Sergio Olivia was a Cuban who escaped Cuba. Cuba. Okay, man. He's smoking a cigar, man, right? That's cool. Right. <laughs> and he escaped. And he won. He defeated Arnold Schwarzenegger to become Mr. Olympia. But because he didn't like to kiss up to people, the man who ran Olympia, his name was uh, Jeff Weider. And Jeff Weider, prior to him getting to bodybuilding, was into gay porn. He was a sick, sick sexual deviant who used mm -hmm. bodybuilding for his sick fantasies. And so Serge Olivia was a man's man, and he told him, you can shove it. And pretty much because he wouldn't kiss up to Joe Weider, he didn't make it. So when he landed in Chicago, became a Chicago cop. Huge. He had a gym there. My brother and my first cousin studied under him the art of bodybuilding. When I saw my brother, I said, man, that's what I want. And Bruce Lee was a big influence too growing up. So I got into bodybuilding. Now, because I got into bodybuilding, I had to get off the drugs. You see what the Lord is doing? He's yeah. using bodybuilding to get me out of smoking pot, drinking and smoking cigarettes. Because now I want to be fit. I want to be muscular. Yeah. And because of that discipline of working out in the 90s, I stopped smoking cigarettes. I stopped drinking. And I stopped <clears throat> getting high because I replaced it with another idol. But that wasn't fulfilling. So that got me off of that. So Lord willing, around the age of 18, I realized as much as I enjoyed bodybuilding, I was still empty inside. I was still miserable inside. I was still lonely because this is what I was looking for. I was looking for that gap left in my heart by a dad who abandoned me and a mother who could not be there for me verbally, meaning she proved her love for me and I love her. I love my mother. I adore her and I can't wait to see her again in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because I know I will see her because Christ is alive and she's alive with the Lord. I know this. I don't doubt the Lord. He's alive. And he says, because I live, you will live also. But my mother was busy dealing with the pain of having the man that she knew all her life pretty much walk away because he was a womanizer and <clears throat> having to spend most of her day getting up at five in the morning, taking buses to work and back, getting home tired at 6 p.m. and not having time to be there for me verbally, meaning to affirm me yeah. with her words. That yeah. left a hole in my heart. Till this day, it's Jesus who's healing that hole. See, Satan knows how to destroy society. And he knows to destroy society by destroying homes. If he can destroy the home, yeah. he destroys the children psychologically, emotionally. Sure. And if he destroys the children, the children, unless they turn to the Lord, will grow up to be psychologically, emotionally misfits. And they will then add to the destruction of society. True. He knows. So that left a hole that till this day I struggle with. Now, let me explain what I mean I struggle with. Jesus is real. He's almighty. And he is pure love and he loves us. But the Lord in his wisdom, he can heal you overnight or heal you over a period of time as a process. Sure. And so the Lord is healing me over a period of time as a process because one thing I still ache from that upbringing of mine when I was a child, a woman's affirmation. Because I always yeah. wanted my mother to affirm me. I always wanted her to tell me she loved me and adored me. She wasn't the type of woman who would verbalize it. She showed it by actions. But that left that need that, you know what? I need uh, that affirmation from my mother. I didn't get it. So that damaged me psychologically, causing me to have low self-esteem. And that hole is still there where I want my mother's affirmation. But since my mother's gone, what do you look for? You look for it in another woman. But sure. may the Lord heal us because... No human being on this side of glory can ever fulfill. But that's, again, just to show you my process, the damage, and how the Lord is healing me of that damage. So 18, still depressed, lonely, because I thought bodybuilding would fill that void. It didn't. 
even though I got pretty muscular and I made a deal with God. Now talk about God and his mercy giving you what you want in order to teach you a lesson. I had made a deal with God. Now remember this time I didn't believe in Jesus anymore. I had lost faith in Jesus, but I knew there may be a God there. But if that God is there, it's not Jesus because I had really felt that Jesus had failed me, which he didn't fail. But again, it is what it is. So I made a deal with God. I said, God, if you let me get muscular, I'll never take steroids. That was my deal. I didn't say if you let me get muscular and I look like, you know, one of these bodybuilders in the magazines, which I never got to that point. I, you know, I was getting there. I won't take steroids. That was my deal. And lo and behold, within about two years of bodybuilding, I got to be like 220 pounds of muscle, flat stomach, no love handles, huge chest, huge, uh, huge arms, striated, no steroids. And people thought I was doing roids. So God answered that prayer. But guess what? Why did he answer? Why would God answer that prayer, a vain prayer? Because he showed me, okay, now that I got what you want, are you happy? No, I was miserable. Yeah. I was empty. So the Lord allowed me so I wouldn't get on, end up getting on steroids and then, you know, growth hormone like all these people are addicted. And a lot of bodybuilders die in their 30s and 40s. He allowed that to show me, even if I give you this, you'll be empty because your heart has a God-shaped vacuum. Not to sound cliche, yeah. your heart will not rest until it rests in God. St. Augustine. Yeah. Oh, Satan, yeah. And I know it's attributed to him, right? Glory to God. So I realized, 18, I go, man, I need God. But that's where my introduction to Islam begins, at around the age of 18. So if you want me to, do you want to say something before I move on? or I just wanted to, uh, yeah, William dropped in the chat, and he said, great show, and he's supporting us. And uh, yeah, so I just want to say, hey, to William, I'm going to have him on my show on the 26th. And we're going to do an episode on the angel of the Lord. I know that sounds familiar because you guys did an episode, which was awesome. Uh, just wanted to shout out everybody in the chat. Thanks for all the support, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, share, and subscribe. I'm at like 1.26K right now for subs. Once I hit 2,000, I'm going to drop a video and I'm going to do a book giveaway. So make sure you subscribe and I'll send you a free book if you live in Canada or the U.S. Yeah, glory to God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Good to see the brother. So real quickly, I want to see if my cat, because it's about to pour. Yeah. My poor cat. I don't want it to drown. But so now I'm going to tell you, at the age of 18, bodybuilding failed me. Where does Islam come into the picture? Now you're going to see. Wow. And I'm going to go into detail. I haven't gone in before. Hey, okay, dude. great. Are you here? All right. All right. Sorry. Cat's not around. Okay. So around the age of 18, I realized I needed God, but... Because of the failures in my life and people that I looked up to disappointing me, I, I thought, you know what? Jesus is in God. May have been a great teacher, no more, no less. All right. Because I was a bodybuilder, I used to do security for a valet parking. <clears throat> valet parking. And it was in Cabrini Green. So some people here from Chicago may remember Bub City. Bub City was this restaurant that had a parking lot that you'd valet cars in Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green wasn't the best area. Mm. Wasn't the best area. But, you know, I was their security because supposedly I'm a bodybuilder and I'm a tough guy, which doesn't matter. You can be a bodybuilder and get beat easy because it doesn't mean you know how to fight. But anyway, you know how it is. Looks. Yeah. So the, the doorman would issue the ticket for the car to be valeted. Turned out he was a member of the Nation of Islam. Now, don't forget, brother, I have no idea about Islam. Right. I was never told by my family about the religion of Islam, even though they were raised in the midst of Muslims because they come from Iraq and then also Kuwait. Never told me about Islam. So I remember I'm valet parking. You know, I'm the security. And this guy, he's African-American. He's black, obviously, nation of Islam. And he kept he would keep saying, praise be almighty Allah. Now, that really baffled me because he's not Assyrian. And in Assyrian, we use the word Allah. Mm -hmm. We want to make it definite. We say Allah. Ha. Right. Allah. Ha. In Assyrian, Allah ha means the God. The God. Yeah. Allah means God. Sound familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Allah. 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 So that's why Muslims say, hey, well, Jesus spoke Aramaic. He would have said Allah. That sounds like Allah. No, but that's fine. Anyway, he said Allah. That, like, man, it piqued my interest. And I said, hey, man, how do you know this word? He then confused the heck out of me because he talked about the honorable Elijah Muhammad. 
Right. Master for our Muhammad. Muhammad. Yep. And Prophet Muhammad. Now, I don't know who these figures are, and I'm thinking maybe they're the same person, right? Mm -hmm. Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. And then he talked about Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I know Farrakhan because I used to see him on TV. Very captivating speaker, orator. He can speak for so. hours, yeah. hours without any notes. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, I used to listen to him all the time. Amazing speaker, isn't he? Absolutely. Sad. I hope he gives his life to Jesus Christ our Lord before it's too late. But Amen. he was the protege of Malcolm X. So guess what? He talked about the Holy Quran. So I asked him for a copy and he gave me a Quran. On top of that, I found out about Malcolm X. So guess what I did? At that time, it was all VHS. There was no YouTube. There was no Netflix. Yeah. You know, it's VCR, Betamax, VHS. So VHS. So I found documentaries on Malcolm X, his speeches. And I started watching. And I got his autobiography by Alex Haley, yeah. Malcolm X. I became glued to Malcolm X. I was fascinated by Malcolm X. And then I started slowly seeing the difference between Nation of Islam and quote-unquote Orthodox Islam. Right. And as I started reading the Quran, now I'm around 18 years old, I am blown away that the Quran mentions the biblical figures that I was raised on and taught by Raymond and his mother, grandmother. He used to call her mama, mother. So in a sense, she was his mother because he never knew his actual biological mother. So hmm. I decided to go find the index, and I believe it was an Abdullah Yusuf Ali Quran. It's where all the references to Jesus. And I read all of them, and I was blown away. Because remember, I came to a point where Jesus may have been a great moral teacher, but he's not God. He's not the Son of God. So what does the Quran present? A Jesus that's not divine. He's not God. He's not the Son of God. Yeah. And I was like, wow, how come no one told me about this religion that mentions the biblical prophets, these prophets, Abraham and Moses and Jesus? No one told me. So in my heart and mind, I started believing the Quran is true and Muhammad was a prophet. Now, I don't know anything about Sunni Islam. Even when I read Malcolm X and that he supposedly went to Mecca and had a conversion, I still don't know about Sunni Islam, Shia Islam. I, I still don't know any of that. And I didn't know that according to Sunni Islamic tradition, you must say the Shahadatain. You must bear witness there is no God but Allah and bear witness Muhammad is his messenger in front of at least two Muslims and mean it for you to be considered Muslim. I don't know any of that. But I know that I'm believing this book. But then that got me curious. That put a curiosity into me to go back and read the New Testament. This is where the war begins. So I'm reading the New Testament. I'm reading about Jesus again, the Jesus that I was taught by the Baptist church that I was taught by Raymond and his grandmother. I'm reading the Gospels and I'm seeing Jesus and I'm falling in love with the Jesus of the New Testament, the Gospels again. But I'm now torn because I believe Muhammad is a prophet. I believe yeah. he was sincere. But the message is contradictory. So what do I do with that? What yeah, do I do with the fact? It's funny yeah. that. Go ahead. It's, fu it's funny, brother, that, you know, and we talked about this on, uh, on your show when we, did, we did when you had me on. Uh, our journey kind of overlapped in a certain way even with the nation of islam which is which is rather hysterical when you think about it yeah right, right. Like a white group. guy right what, what what's he doing there you know, but yeah. it's just funny the uh, the intersections and the parallels i didn't mean to cut you off uh no, but no, i no, just no, wanted no, to throw free. that in there no no feel free to do it because you know i want to make sure that my journey is clear and i don't leave anything that's essential out so people can understand i just got to charge make sure that thing so it doesn't die the battery yeah, yeah. Okay, so now it's it takes about again. Remember, this is in the '90s, so my memory is not what it used to. So I'm trusting those spirit to help me recall at least the gist of my journey. I believe it took me about two years to finally resolve this issue because I was confused. Sure. Obviously, Jesus in the New Testament, he's a son of God, but in the Quran, he's not. But I'm convinced Muhammad is a prophet. So what do I do with that? How do I overcome this obstacle? Because I don't think Muhammad is making it up. And it doesn't help there. Give me literature to show how sincere he was, how he suffered, you know, and they gave him the carrot and stick saying, hey, you know, we'll give you all the virgins and all the money. Just stop attacking our idols. And he refused to. I'm like, wow, man. So this man wasn't making it up. Because I remember I'm not a theologian. I don't know scriptures that well. Even growing up, I only knew what I was taught. And they didn't go in depth. Then finally, as I started reading the New Testament, it clicked on me. Muhammad was deceived by Satan. 
And that made it easy for me to let go. All right. Mm. So he was sincere because he was deceived. He was convinced by Satan or an evil spirit that he's a true prophet, which is why he suffered for his cause, because he was deceived. He wasn't making it up. So that enabled me to then completely reject Muhammad. And this is around now I'm around 20 years old. So we're talking about 1992. But because I now have rediscovered my faith in Christ or reignited, the Holy Spirit reignited my love for the Jesus of the New Testament, I started talking about Jesus and sharing the gospel locally. Now, one of the people that I shared the gospel with, he was a Bosnian. His hmm. Bosnians, for the most part, are Muslims. Right. His dad was a boxing coach. He used to teach boxing, and he had a professional heavyweight fighter that he used to coach. Now, this young man, my age, would teach me how to box because now I'm segueing. I'm coming out of bodybuilding and kickboxing, and eventually I'm going to devote myself to full-time ministry. But I'm still bodybuilding. I'm still into kickboxing because I didn't mention that part. I started kickboxing because I thought I was going to be the Assyrian Bruce Lee. So he would teach me how to box, and i teach him how to lift weights. But we'd engage in conversation, and I started talking about Jesus, and he started getting interested, and he started believing the Jesus of the Gospels. So his Muslim friends at the local community college, Wright College. So those of you in Chicago know where I'm talking about. Wright College, W-R-I-G-H-T. They would have Juma prayer on campus, Friday prayer. Mm -hmm. And they bring in an imam to lead them in prayer. And he started missing. So the Muslims there saw that this guy's not coming. So they asked him, what's going on? And he pretty much said, well, you know what? I'm starting to get interest in New Testament. That brought them into panic. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. So they realized, uh-oh. A missionary and for those of you who don't know if the muslims label you a missionary that's a derogatory term missionaries are those who are financed by the brits as the brits came into muslim territories to then colonize muslim lands and brought in the missionaries to convert muslims so missionary has a very negative <clears throat> feeling sentiment to the muslim if they call you a missionary you're pretty much <clears throat> someone who is coming to destroy the culture, the religion, the traditional values of the Muslims. Yeah, because yeah. sadly, when the Brits came and colonized the world, they brought in also, or the missionaries came in after them, preaching the gospel and trying to convert Muslims. So they saw this as a diabolical scheme by the British overlords to try to destroy Islamic culture and have them become Christians so they can be pretty much lambs led to the slaughter. So they saw the missionaries as carrying out the dirty work of the British Empire. So to be called a missionary is insulting. It's derogatory. If they label a missionary at that time, that meant, oh, this guy is of the devil. He's here to destroy our religion, our family values. So be careful. So they want to know who is this missionary that's causing one of their own to question Islam. So I met his friends. Now, again, I'm close to 20 years old around this time. I don't know much about Islam. Yeah, about after 20, yeah, 1992. So I'm trying to get the exact time. Okay. And I don't know much about Christianity. I'm green in both religions. I'm just learning. But they were green too. They didn't know much about Islam. They didn't know much about Christianity. So it was stalemate. I couldn't convince them. They couldn't convince me. So they brought in the big guns. They brought in a Muslim da'i. Can, can I, I can mention his name, right? doesn't matter. You can. Yeah, you can. He's not famous, but he was a student of Ahmed Didai. And at that time, Zakir Naik was on the rise. It's late right. 1992, right. 92, after 92, 93, 94, so on. His name was Habib Raja. Habib Raja, who used to be into real estate, if my memory doesn't fail me. So he devoted himself on the side to study the arguments of Ahmed Didai. Because Ahmed Didai would write booklets and even had a book called Combat Kit. This is mm. your kit for combat against the missionaries. And so he came in this church that I was attending. It was a Korean Protestant church. And he had a folder. I remember the color. He had it under his arm. Black folder, you know, like a would bind, you know, different sections. Sections, you know, yeah. a folder, you, you know, where you have papers. And you had those rings that, that you know, the papers would be attached to. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I don't know if the, many of people know what we're talking about. Because It's old school, man. Yeah, yeah right? We used to have the beepers. Remember the beepers? Yep, yep. Boy, man, yeah. Like, man, technology. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he walked in the church. He put it on the table. He opened up. 
and he had it divided neatly from what I remember, as I recall, different sections to put different verses from the Bible to destroy the core doctrines of faith. So he started with the Trinity and he brought up verses I couldn't answer and then alleged Bible discrepancies. And he pretty much humiliated me in front of the Muslims. I was humiliated because I didn't have an answer. So that's when I sought the face of the Lord and I said, Lord, I don't know how to answer. I don't know. Yeah, three, three ring binder. Yeah. I don't know how to answer. I don't know what I'm supposed to believe about the Trinity. Because even then, the Trinity was something new. I was now being introduced to the Trinity, something I didn't even know. Growing up as a child in the Baptist church, they didn't talk about the Trinity. They didn't tell me about Father, Son, and Spirit being one God and Jesus is not the Father. I didn't know this. Even Raymond didn't teach me this. Even his grandmother didn't teach me this. So when as I'm coming back, I know Jesus, Son of God, but is he God? If so, is he the Father? But he can't be... So I'm still on a journey. I'm green. I don't know this. So it didn't help. This guy came and attacked the Trinity, quoting verses that really baffled me. Yeah. Right. I got really baffled. I didn't know. Okay, what am I supposed to believe? So then for days, maybe even a couple of weeks, I would go at night and cry out to the Lord, sometimes in tears. And I said to the Lord the following. This is in the 90s. I said, Lord, if you give me answers to these objections, I promise that I'll commit myself to never allowing any other Christian to be humiliated the way he humiliated me. That was my deal. Lord, if you give me answers to these objections, I promise to devote myself to making sure no other Christian gets humiliated the way this Muslim humiliated me. This is why, if you guys pay attention, 90% of my focus, over 90% sessions and articles, is in strengthening, confirming the faith of Christians and the core doctrines of the Christian faith. I don't spend as much time attacking or criticizing Islam. I spend more time and trying to get Christians to know why they should believe in these core doctrines and what are the biblical basis for these core doctrines mm -hmm. so that no Muslim shakes their confidence that these doctrines are revelations from God and the Bible is God's word. And these Amen. doctrines are found in scripture. Mm -hmm. So that's because he attacked my faith. So that put a burn in my heart, a fire in my bosom, to then provide biblical answers to these criticisms. And that started my journey by the grace of the chime God. So then there was a center that had opened, a Christian outreach to Muslims locally in the area, South Asian Friendship Center. And it's, I think it, start, it opened in 97. So I knew a couple of the missionaries there because I had met them by the grace of God providentially because they were missionaries to Muslims, two of them from Pakistan. And one of them, the late Vern Rock, who has sent, since gone to be with the Lord Jesus, had a library of books and booklets by some of the leading pioneers in Muslim evangelism. Samuel Zwemer, St. Claire Tistal, C.G. Fander, right? And one in particular who's still alive, who's still with us, who's from South Africa, John Gilchrist. John Gilchrist is a South African lawyer that the Lord Jesus raised up in South Africa to put Didot in his place. And every booklet that Didot wrote, he wrote a booklet refuting his arguments. And Vern Rock had his booklets and his books, all of which you can now read for free on Answering Islam. In fact, let me get you the link. Maybe you can share. Are you able to screen share? Because I can yeah. do it. Uh, I can. If you put it in the chat, I can. I will do that. On the, yeah. Because I want people to see. Now, in the 90s, we didn't have this. I had to buy the books and the booklets. Now they're online for free. So here you go. Yeah, put it in the chat and I'll put it on yeah. the screen. And you yeah. can show it on screen because I want people to see this. Here it is. Here is John Gilchrist. So here's link number one. And open up. This, this man, the Lord used him to strengthen me and train me and shape me and mold me. So here it is in private chat if you can show them. There it goes. The brethren, here it is. I don't know if he, we lost them for a second. Anyway, he'll be back. So there it goes, guys. So what I had to buy, books and booklets, is now online for free. Thanks to the internet. All you pay is for the internet connection. You catch it? Yeah, sorry. I just lost you, bro, for a second. The stream, stream For the first time in 78 episodes, StreamYard actually kicked me out. So uh, I apologize for that momentary lapse there. That's demonic. Satan's angry, but we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And filled Amen. With Amen. There's a link. If you want to open up and show them. 
Did you put it in the live chat, brother? I put it also in private chat for you on StreamYard. If you look at private chat. Okay. Can you can you actually put it in the public one? Yep, I did. Okay. Let me do it again. I yeah, because I don't see it. Oh, but it won't let me because I have to be a mod. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't screen share. Oh. Um, so you, but if you were able to see it, you'd be able to click in and open it up. Yeah, I would be. Yeah. Well, make me a mod temporarily, and then it'll show. Is there a uh, is the website address like easy to remember? Answeringislam.info. Okay, answeringislam.info. Okay, so everybody yeah, check that out. Up, let's let's go through it if you can. So if you open up, you'll be able to show it, or you can. I don't think I can. Oh, okay, then forget about it. My then apologies. Worry. No, it's okay. I thought you could screen share because I don't know how to do that yet. I know William does. He does. Yeah, yeah you guys are good at that together. Yeah. He, he's good. I I suck. So anyway. <laughs> same. Okay. Anyway, if you go to answeringislam.info, check out individual authors. John Gilchrist. His booklets are there, and we have a classical library of all the giants of the Christian faith who in the late 19th century, early 20th century, were missionaries who produced books and booklets to refute Muslims. Anyway, South Asian Friendship Center opened up 1997. So I would go there and use their computer and start writing, answeringislam.info, answeringislam.info. So I'd go there and start writing because what I wanted to do was Write verses out so I can then print and carry with me like the Muslim did. You remember the folder? Right. So I wanted to do something similar where I'd have, let's see, one article just on verses showing Jesus claimed to be God. Another article and so on. Because I was afraid I wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to recall the verses. So as I started writing in the year... 1998, late 1998, a website was started, Answering Islam, answeringislam.info, was started. Still active? By, yep, by a brother named Jochen Katz, who is from Germany, who was here in America, Atlanta, studying to get his PhD in mathematics. But he encountered Muslims on the university, and he wanted to find answers and couldn't find answers online, so he started the Answering Islam website. He started it. So then, late 1998... Someone told me, contact him, and maybe you can submit these articles. So I said, hey, brother, I'm writing some stuff on Islam. What do you think? He liked it. So then in 1999, the Lord confirmed. He gave me a confirming sign. Devote myself to full-time ministry. So I began becoming the chief writer, the full-time writer for Answering Islam. 1999, that's when it started. That's when I went into full-time ministry. So this is how I started engaging Muslims. Okay. So that's how I... <clears throat> Got interested in Islam. That's how I got into full-time ministry because I had made a promise to the Lord. Lord, I will devote myself to making sure no Christian gets humiliated by a Muslim ever again if you give me answers. And God was working providentially because during this time, Answering Islam came into being. And I became the chief writer for Answering Islam, doing full-time ministry since 1999. I never, never looked back. So that's my journey thus far. But obviously... You want to talk about my anti-Catholicism and how I ended up? <laughs> you read my mind, brother. I was just going to ask. So during this during this uh, sojourn in your journey here, what's your view of Catholics and Catholicism? Okay, remember what I said that though Raymond's grandmother was a Catholic, I didn't know. So right. I didn't know what she was. I'm finding out later. Remember, I said that I would be taken on a bus route to First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Yep. Well, you know, independent fundamental fundamental Baptists, they're anti-Catholics. The the Pope is the Antichrist. The Catholic Church is the Antichrist system. And it didn't help. They would distribute chick tracks. Yeah. And in my neighborhood, there was a Christian bookstore who would sell chick tracks and chick comics. So I was fed on chick tracks. I was fed on chick comic books. For those oh, of you who don't know chick, it's still in business. Jack T. Chick who has since deceased, he was a King James only independent fundamental Baptist who wrote tracts bashing the Catholic Church. And in the, was it 90s, probably 80s, someone who claimed to be a former Jesuit spy. Right, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, about right. Yeah. You know all this, uh, you're smart. <laughs> well, you, th that one, the death cookie, right? And there, there's the yeah. one where they, they have the all the Protestants' name in the computer in the Vatican, right? And they're going to yes, kill yes, them all. Yes, yeah. Right. Why is Mary weeping, right? It's right. crying. I've, it's been a while. I haven't read them. But now imagine you're a young man 
and this is your diet, chick tracks and chick mm-hmm. comics and Baptists. And what are you going to think of the Pope? Right. What are you going to think of the Catholic Church? And then it didn't help when they sp- freak you out that now I come back. Now, as I come back, I try to give the Assyrian Church another chance. But I am still indoctrinated with chick track theology. I still think any church that resembles a Catholic Church is a false church. So when I returned to the Assyrian Church, I didn't return with an open mind to understand these ancient litur- liturgical churches, even though the Assyrian Church is labeled Nestorian. I didn't know that. I went there because I was going to be the Savior. I was going to go to the Assyrian Church and see if God would use me to bring them out of the whore of Babylon. Right. You get it? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? So you, you Sounds see familiar. Over? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny now looking at it, right? Yeah. So in the 90s, I went back to the Assyrian Church to give it a chance. But, man, I said, no, man, it's too much like Catholicism, man, the Eucharist and all that. I got to save them. So what happened? I started distributing chick tracks, but I try to do it stealthily because I knew if they find out, they're going to get angry. Well, one guy found out. He saw a track. He goes, don't distribute these here anymore. I go, well, if I can't distribute them, I'm never coming back. The hell with you. And I left. 90. So I left the Assyrian Church. So because of that, I thought the Pope, and, and during this time, sadly, a friend of mine, big mistake, he gave me a series of audio cassettes. Because at that time, there were audio cassettes where a man is talking about the Illuminati, oh, the yeah. Bilderbergers, Adam yep. Weishaupt. Yep, yep, yep. Do you know what I'm about? Yep. I'm freaking out. I'm listening to this man, and he's got this, he sounds older, and he's got this voice, this eerie voice, and he's freaking me out. He's, I'm, I'm like paranoid now. Illuminati. Adam Weishaupt infiltrates, right? Rothschilds, the Bilderbergers, Trilateral Commission, and the Masons have infiltrated the Catholic Church. And there's a real Pope. It's the Black Pope. And yes, you sir. Get, right? Not, not that he's black. He wears black. <laughs> this is and the rabbit right? hole. So you're laughing because you went through this too, right? I did, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Now. Some of these guys think, man, dude, this, these guys are nuts. <laughs> It's great. funny, but that's what it was. I'm but, yeah, out. for sure. I was serious about it, too, and you were, too. Dude, in fact, let me tell you how serious I was. I was going at this time to a Presbyterian church by an Assyrian pastor named uh, P, uh, Peter Talia. He since the sea went to be the Lord, Peter Talia. I got so paranoid, I thought he was a plant by the Illuminati <laughs> sent to pretend to be a pastor in order to infiltrate and destroy the church from within. So I freaked out. Here comes Alberto Rivera, because that's what Alberto Rivera says, right? That's right. For those of you who don't know, if you go to Chick Tracks, Alberto Rivera claimed to be a Jesuit, was trained to infiltrate churches because the Jesuits have their tentacles everywhere. So they send fake Protestant pastors to infiltrate churches to destroy them from within in order to bring them back to Rome. Sounds legit. Right? So now... You got Alberto Rivera saying this. You got these dudes telling me the same thing about the Illuminati and the Rothschilds and the Bilderbergers. They're all working together. And then you have St. Ignatius of Loyola, who started the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, to infiltrate the Protestants. (gasps) And I'm freaking out and I'm paranoid. And my buddy doesn't help me. He's more paranoid than me because every time we go somewhere, he goes, hey, don't you ever drink or eat whatever anyone gives you because you don't know if it's a plant sent to poison you. And I'm thinking, wow. you walk in, you walk in. I'm not lying. I don't want to mention his name. He's still my friend. <laughs> right? He's, he's simmered down quite a bit, but I don't want to mention his name. But he's my friend. We're still good buddies. So if, if you walked in, you sat next to me, he would nudge me. Hey, 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 be careful. You don't know if they sent him. And he got me to the point where I started getting paranoid of the pastor. And I started asking him questions. I said to the pastor, who's a Syrian, I said, hey, uh, when did you become a Protestant minister? Oh, I was in Syria. And then some Protestant missionaries came and recruited me. (gasps) Red flag. There it is. He was recruited. Where did you go study? In England. (gasps) England, British. You see what happened to me? Yes, sir. I was paranoid out of my mind. All right. The Lord then 
simmered me down where I didn't become paranoid, but I still thought about the Illuminati and the connection with the Masons and the Pope, you know, papacy and so on and so forth. Now I get introduced to Calvinism. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that I work with, they are telling me about Calvinism. And my first reaction is this is of the devil. If this is God, this is not God. This is the devil. I don't want to have nothing to do with such a God. A God that predestines people to be saved and reprobates others? What kind of gospel is this? Well, then here's what did it for me. <clears throat> Someone said, well, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, right? Or I'm sorry, because now they've influenced me about God's sovereignty and predestination, that you cannot choose God unless he enables you. And God only enables the elect, right? Right. So then... As I was reading 1 Corinthians 12, 3, this jumped out on me. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. And that's how I go, oh, my goodness, they're right, Calvinism. So I bought into it. Then during this time, look how it works. As I'm being introduced to Calvinism, I'm now discovering James White and Robert Morey, two mm -hmm. Reformed <clears throat> Calvinists, both of whom are Baptists, both of whom bash Catholics, both of whom debate Catholics. So now I'm being introduced to Calvinism. Now I'm being introduced to these men because Robert Morey, the reason why I found him, because he was one of the pioneers exposing Islam. He wrote one of the mm. first books showing the threat of Islam called the Islamic invasion. Let me show it to you. Hold on. Now he's a five point. Now also he too has passed away. I love this guy. He's great. God bless him. <laughs> Having so, so much fun, book. guys. Right? This is the book. Because remember, I've been dealing with Muslims, so I'm going to run into Christian authors. And this is the book. Mm. This is a trend-setting book. This is the first book that I'm aware of, Islamic Invasion. This is the original edition. Let's see what year it came out. This was published by Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon. And again, let me see the date, 1992. You see the date, guys? 1992. I think my cat's knocking. Guys, I'm 20 years old, 1992. Now, I discovered this book, and he's a trendsetter because this is the first book that I'm aware of. Is there are books before that? I don't know. Where he has a section on the Hadiths. Or the Hadiths, Okay. Share this episode, guys, please. And he Subscribe. Had a section on the silly, stupid, irrational teachings of Al Bukhari. I did not know about the Hadith. This man was a trendsetter. And he's the one who made the moon god theory popular. It's all in this book. It's in this book. 1992. He introduces me to the concept that Allah of pre Islamic, pre -Islamic Arabia is the moon god. He introduces me to silly, stupid teachings of the Hadith in Bukhari because he has a section right here. Right here, it's if you go, and he has a section a section on the Nation of Islam, part six, the Nation of Islam. But his section on the Hadith, let me just show you, where is it? Appendix A, an analysis of the Hadith, page 177. This book had it all for me. And he talks about some silly stuff like Satan in the nose. I didn't know that. Here it is. Analysis of Eddie. So this is the book. So I got blown away. So I reached out to his ministry. Then I saw his debates that he had with Catholics like Robert Fastigi. And then shortly thereafter, I'm introduced to James White because now I become a Calvinist. As the time is going by years after this. And then James White's debates with Roman, Roman Catholics. And I'm diehard pro <clears throat> Catholic, I'm not Catholic, I'm sorry, pro-Calvinist. I'm a Calvinist, five-point Calvinist, diehard Calvinist, right? And sola scriptura, sola fide. And the Catholic Church is an abomination. The Catholic Church preaches a false gospel. The Pope is the Antichrist. Because a lot of people don't know that the magisterial reformers identified the Pope as the Antichrist. And you're aware of this more than I am. This Correct. Is part of their belief. This is part of their rallying cry. The Pope is the Antichrist. This is an antichrist system, right? So if you are reformed, if you're a Calvinist, then this is your heritage. The magisterial reformers condemn the Pope as antichrist. So if you are a Calvinist, you're reformed, this is your heritage. 
It's built in your system to hate Catholicism and the papacy. It's in your system. Now, in any system that's similar to Catholicism, that's liturgical, sacramental, sacerdotal, like Orthodox, they go too. And so Absolutely. I'm, in, yep. I'm influenced. But guess what's happening, brother? Here's how the Lord's working on me. As I'm watching the debates between James White, and I'm wanting James White to win. I want him to win. Some debates he does good, and he just, man, excites me. But a few debates in particular messed me up. The debate he had with Robert Sungenis on justification by faith. I had many sleepless nights because of how bad James White did and how good Robert Sungenis did. But I wasn't open to accepting the possibility that James White may be wrong, Calvinism may be wrong. So I was on a mission. I have to destroy Robert Sungenis. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't help that Sungenis and others came up with massive tomes, not by bread alone, not by scripture alone, not by faith alone, all of which I got, but I was too afraid to read. So I bought the books and I still have them in my library, but I was too afraid to read them because I was mm. afraid they're going to rock my foundation and I can't answer. But I knew one thing. They can't be right. I was such a staunch anti-Catholic. They can't be right. They just may be able to sway people with rhetoric and biblical distortion like Satan does. Yep. And I may not be able to answer. And I don't want to even dare read these books thoroughly because they may shake my foundation. Right. The problem right. is the seeds of doubt are already being planted. As I'm watching these debates, I'm starting to question. And then one gentleman in particular that I don't give enough credit for, and I despised him in the beginning. I couldn't stand this guy. And I wanted James White to steamroll him and destroy him. He's still in ministry, but he doesn't do speaking. He'll tell you. He's not a speaker, and he's not a debater. He does written exchanges, and he will debate you, provided it's written format. We will write posts. You know, post by post. You write a post, I write a post. And I couldn't stand the guy because there was no stopping him. He'd write one post after another to respond. And some of his posts were very lengthy. And I was upset because I thought he's going to give me the impression he's refuting the other side. You coward, why don't you? Because James White would beg him, debate me. Dave Armstrong. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I couldn't stand this dude because this, the stuff I read from him, he was rocking me. And sadly, I don't give him enough credit. Dave Armstrong is still active, brethren. He is still writing posts. He still has a blog. And he was a thorn in James White's side. He would shred James White on the church fathers and what they actually said, especially about what's known as the monarchical episcopate. That early on among the apostolic churches, they appointed a bishop to be the head of the church. And underneath him, a college of presbyters, and underneath them, deacons. What's known as a monarchical, monarchial episcopate. Because James White believes in a plurality of elders. So when he would respond to James White, and he would quote Ignatius, he would eat me up. I was going crazy. I wanted him to lose. And James White couldn't stand him, and James White wouldn't even touch him, wouldn't try to even respond. And his excuse was, let's have a debate, oral, verbal debate, because James White knows if he does a written exchange, he'll get annihilated because he's a master of rhetoric and emotional manipulation. And I got to see that later on. But this planet seeds. And I started now listening more to the Catholics. Patrick mm -hmm. Madrid was another guy. When he debated James White on Sola Scriptura, their debate, which is all over the Internet, I was livid and upset because I wanted James White to win. And in my mind, I said he won because of exegesis of 2 Timothy 3. But the arguments that Patrick Madrid brought up, he threw at him everything in the kitchen sink. And fairly, not saying he went off topic. In topic, and the arguments he brought up murdered me, killed me, because he brought up good points. And I didn't want to accept it. I did not want to accept. I really did not want to accept. They had some good arguments. And then his debate with Jerry Maddox on Sola Scriptura made me cry. Mm, literally? He Anger. But I was glad when James White debated Jerry Maddox on the Marian doctrines because I thought he schooled Jerry Maddox in both of the debates. Little did I realize he didn't school Jerry Maddox. It's just Jerry Maddox was not equipped. Because when I went back and checked the arguments, James White was the one being dishonest 
and he was misquoting and misleading people. I have to be honest with that because I checked. So these seeds are now planted. This is now 2000, 2001, 2002. And I keep going back and forth. And then when I'm confronted with the fathers, this is what did it for me. When I could see that, for example, Ignatius believed in a monarchical, some will say monarchical, however you want to pronounce it, episcopate, that the bishop is the head of the church. Underneath them are a college of elders, presbyters, who are sub subject to the bishop. And underneath them are deacons. And that bothered me, but I saw it's there. C could I say he's wrong? How? He's a disciple of the apostles. Yeah. He met the apostles. He knows John. He's appointed by them. In Antioch, Syria, of all places, where they're first called Christians, a hotbed of apostolic activity. And he dies as a martyr. How can he be wrong? But then I'm, I'm seeing quotes where people are interpreting John 3, 5. You must be born of water and the spirit as referring to water, baptismal regeneration. Irenaeus, even the Epistle of Artemis, and I'm getting messed up. How? How are they believing in water baptismal generation, regeneration? How could Irenaeus, who's a disciple of Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, the disciple of the apostles? So here's an eyewitness of the apostles appointed by them to be bishop, who then dies as a martyr at 86, burned alive, whose disciple is Irenaeus, another martyr, because he gets martyred too, who's a bishop of Lyon's France. And he says, John 3, 5, when Jesus says you must be born of water and spirit, means being born in the waters of baptism where the Holy Spirit will be given to you to make you alive, unite to your Christ, and remove your sins. Mm. Why are they interpreting these texts this way? Because I'm taught as a Baptist, and I'm taught as a Reformed Baptist, because I don't become Presbyterian. I'm a Reformed Baptist. It's believer's baptism, and baptism is symbolic. It symbolizes your union with Christ, that when you believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus, you're united to Christ, you are buried, and raised a new creation. Now, that was my Baptist theology. Later on, when I became a high Calvinist, regeneration doesn't even take place after you believe. It takes place before you believe. Right. That's the, the Calvinism of James White. Not all Calvinists believe that. There are Calvinists who believe that you must believe in Christ, then you're regenerated. But the Calvinism represented by James White, this high Calvinism is, the Spirit must make you alive, regenerate you first, in order for you then to be able to believe in Christ and be united to Him. Yeah, total modernism. Yeah, man, I'm like blown away, man. I'm like, what's going mm -hmm. on here? But the more I'm reading the Fathers, the more I'm seeing, they hold doctrines that if they were here today, if Athanasius was here today, like in the Nicene Creed, here guys, don't believe me, Nicene Creed. It says, I believe in one baptism for forgiveness of sins. Historically, what that meant was, I believe that in water baptism, the Holy Spirit is sent upon the one being baptized to make that person alive spiritually, uniting him to Christ, and that union produced by the Spirit through the act of water baptism is what then removes your sin. This is what they believe. And both the Orthodox and the Heterodox, both the true believers and the heretics like Arian, Arius, believe this. This was the universal belief. And they enshrined it in the Nicene Creed that if you're going to deny this and you're not a true Christian and you'll be thrown out of the church. And that bothered me. So guess what I did to try to get around it? You know what I said? Hmm. I go, look at the brilliance of God. Look at God's wisdom. Though they wrote, I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, they didn't insert the word water. So I can legitimately amen it because the baptism that results in forgiveness of sins is spirit baptism, where the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. You're baptized into the Spirit, immersed into the Spirit, who immerses you into Christ. Yeah, that baptism does result in forgiveness. So it's spirit baptism. I can amen it. But I was being dishonest and unfaithful to their intent, right? What's blowing me away, uh, Sam, is that like you were being shaken in the early 2000s. Yep. I, I thought this was like this just started a couple of years ago. No. This, this goes back. It sadly started watching James White's debate with the Catholics. And it started in 2000, like 2001, 2002. So that even just recently, I shared a clip from who at that time was an evangelical Christian. He was an evangelical Christian. If I remember, he said 2008. I played him. I played the clip, the voice. I don't know him. In fact, here, let me play it here. He gave me permission to play it. Okay. To tell you how far back 
this war began. Let me see it because he sent me in and he gave me permission to play it. So let me play it for you. All right. I put it on my live stream. So he won't mind. But I just want to hear. I think he said 2008. Over 20 years ago, right? Or no, no. Right. Over 10 years ago, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Just over 10. Yep. So here. As a witness, so people don't think I'm like, because somebody's, oh, you're just lying, fam. You're doing it for the money because now you're working for the Jesuit and you're getting paid. <laughs> Got to get that money, man. That's right, man. The Jesuit, bro. I'm part of the Illuminati, by the way. So the best tasting pizza is Illuminati pizza. Illuminati pizza, right? Let me see. Here it goes. Here it is, this guy right here. Okay. And now, let me just say, it's going to take a while for it to come up. Let me go here. Uh, profile. Let me do this. Hold on, because it's uh, my, I don't know if it's my connection. No, my connection's good. Let me go here. Hold on, brother. Let me do this. All right. Yep, here it is. Let me play it. Okay, guys, here. You're going to hear it from this man right here. Okay, let me see. Okay, here you go. Hi, Juan. Okay. Have, have you also, brother, been? Okay, notice. All right, there. Let me go here. Guys, listen. This brother, he's going to tell you. Okay, here. Me and my wife, we moved to Fresno uh, for work-related reasons, but we're currently attending uh, a Serbian Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, St. Peter the Apostle here in uh, Fresno, California. You see what church he's attending? A Serbian Orthodox, yes, right? Yes, yes. Why? Now listen, here's the testimony. Listen, guys. This is when I was uh, a zealous Protestant back in the day. Um, I think this is probably back around 2008. See? This is a long time ago, but it was you and me. I don't know if you remember Brother Zaki and uh, my, uh, my friend Ninos. We're sitting in In-N-Out, and uh, we were talking, and, and uh, I said something to the effect of, uh, you know, how if, if, if people don't believe in the gospel, the way it's presented from, you know, an evangelical Protestant perspective, then they won't be saved. And you looked at me, and you said, uh, you said, uh, for 1,500 years, there wasn't a single Christian in antiquity who expressed the gospel the way you express it today. So are you going to sit here and tell me uh, that they weren't saved? What year was it, brother? 2008. 2008. Now, he then provides details what happened after I planted that seed. Just that seed that came out of my mouth, 2008. I'm still not pro, you know, Catholic or Orthodox. But I am not anti. I'm not pro, but not anti. In other words, you know what? There are true believers in all churches, and yeah. leave it at that. I'm still a Calvinist. Now watch here. So your question just made me think. It, it played a pivotal role because fast forward about maybe five, six years later, in between that time, I met some Catholics who asked me some questions regarding, you know, they challenged Sola Scriptura, which led me down a long rabbit trail of watching many debates between James White. There you go. You know, the Catholic apologists like Robertson Genes and Jerry Maddox and all those guys, Patrick Madrid. So I studied it. I studied it for a very, very long time. Uh, I started reading the church fathers. I started looking into what they believed about the Eucharist. I started looking at, you know, what they believed about the Bible and apostolic succession. Uh, long story short, it ended up leading me to the Eastern Orthodox Church. You got gotcha. it? 2008, brother. Here, I have a witness. So people don't think I'm lying. Wow. Never. I could never have imagined. Now, it's ironic, he came to the ancient churches before I did. He he ended up embracing Eastern Orthodoxy, which is, again, the Eastern lung of the church, sister church to the Catholics. Like you said, you acknowledge and love that church, even though you may have disagreements. That the, that's fine. That's some you two sisters, meaning these two churches have to debate and settle. We new kids on the block. This is new to us. We're learning, right? Right. So here you heard this is not something that happened overnight. So contrary to these liars and slanderers who slander and lie thinking I'm doing it for the money. No, it is not something I came overnight. I struggled and agonized for years. This is already in 2008. I said that year. You're, you're telling me for 1500 years, no one had your gospel. So were they saved? This is one of the reasons why I changed. Because when I saw the early church fathers, they didn't believe in sola fide the way the Protestant reformers taught it. They didn't believe, for example, baptism was merely symbolic or that the Eucharist was a symbol. They believed the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, and that water baptism is the physical instrumental means by which you receive the Holy Spirit to make you spiritual alive and unite you to Christ. 
These things then soften my heart saying, okay, well, if they believed it and they were the true Christians, these were the true bishops, the true Orthodox believers who defended the truth against the heretics, and they're in heaven because if they didn't go to heaven, then Jesus failed to preserve the church. Blasphemy, right? And if they didn't go, then there's definitely no hope for us. Then that means I can't be harsh on the Orthodox and the Catholics anymore. But even during that period, when I try to be nice to Catholics and Orthodox, at times the old me would come to the forefront and I would attack. And that happened between you and me several times, remember? Yeah. <laughs> because why? I was struggling. It was yeah. a war inside me, brother. Sure. So when you would come, even then, because guys, you won't understand the agony, the emotional pain and distress to go through this experience. They won't understand. Because I, even though I became open to the fact there are true believers who love Jesus in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, these are all my brothers and sisters, I still did not want to accept these churches. And I still wanted to hold to my Protestantism. So when someone like this brother would come and offer a critique of something I said about the Catholic Church, my old anti-Catholic beast would come to the forefront. Yeah! But then I'd come back to reality. You remember? And then you graciously... Out of the love for the Lord, you did not repay my arrogance. Likewise, evil for evil, you walked away and ignored me. I prayed for you still. The way I learned, the way I learned, someone presses me and eggs me on, my wicked pride, sinful nature kicks to the forefront. I don't listen. But if someone just plants seeds or water seeds in me or gives me a link and leaves me be, let me wrestle with my own flesh and demons, that's how I grow. God bless so, you, brother. Yeah, glory to God. That's the Holy Spirit, not me. Then finally, about two years ago, I think it was about two years ago, I said, why am I fighting? Man? Mm -hmm. It started to speed up in 2017. Now, can I share some miracle stories in 2017 that has to do with all Catholics? You absolutely can. And somebody just said, this is an endless cigar. Yes, I smoke it right to the nub. I get my money's worth because I got a limited budget. So there you go. But yeah, share your miracle stories, brother. Okay, now watch. It started in 2017 when I went through that bitter divorce because of adultery. And I don't want to get into that because that's not the part I want to focus on. I said, you know what? I'm going to seek the intercession of saints. Because hmm. I had now convinced myself, biblically, mind you, that the saints are alive, glorified, perfected, in the presence of the Lord, free of all sin and burdens. And God makes them aware of what takes place on earth. So then I said to myself, then what's hindering me from seeking their intercession? So I'm going to seek the intercession. And I remember that first time I went to a Catholic church and I asked the Blessed Mother to pray. I was scared. Yeah. So 2017, I asked her intercession and I was afraid. Right. And but I said, I'm going to take a step of the Holy Spirit. I'm entrusting myself to you. Save me from idolatry and blasphemy. Please do not let me follow a journey that will lead to my destruction. So I'm taking a step of faith because I believe she's alive. And by your power, she's aware. You make them aware. So I asked her to pray for me. And now some miracle stories that has to do with the Catholic Church. I'll give you two. And then if you have any mother, other questions you want me to clarify, I'll, <clears throat> feel free. Yeah. One was during November when I got thrown out of my home due to a corrupt judge so that my ex-wife could bring her lover into the house, a pain in my heart that I'm still healing from. A pain in my heart that I'm still healing from. To be barred from my home and having someone else come in with my daughters there without me there to protect them. In November, it was cold, Chicago's cold. I was staying at my friend's place. He had a garage that he converted into an apartment. It was like a garage, but been changed to become like an apartment. It wasn't right. really a garage. And he let me stay there for free. The Lord bless him. He was there in my time of need. It was now Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving where I can't spend it with my children. And I don't know where to go because places are closed. So I thought I was going to go to Panera Bread, but it was closed. So the only place that was open was IHOP, International House of Pancakes. So a couple of sisters in the Lord, also broken marriages or family, decided we're going to meet at IHOP. So I get to IHOP, true story, brother. And I got several sisters, one of whom went to be with the Lord not too long ago. But two sisters who were there that can verify this. They come to my channel. It was 2017, Thanksgiving, and I hop. I'm waiting for them to come. I'm parked outside. I see a white car, small white dinghy car, and two older ladies in it. I got out. They got out. 
the one lady that was younger looked maybe she was like in her 60s maybe and the other one was older maybe in her late 70s so they'll go, they go in they sit on a table i sit right next to them and then the sister-in-law come and we're talking and we're talking about what's going on with me and what the court is doing to me and what my ex-wife is doing to me and her adultery and my daughters and not being with them and then we're talking about jesus so then another person came so we had to move to another table so we moved to another table and I'm talking, and all of a sudden I turn, and the two ladies are right next to me, right here to my right. I'm sitting, so I look. They're right here to my right. I'm like, oh, oh. The youngest of the two looks at me and says, we were not listening, but we were listening. In other words, she's saying, look, sorry for us being uh, you know, nosy. Yeah. We want to hear you, but we couldn't help but hear you. And she goes, oh, boy, the words that came out of your mouth about Jesus. <gasps> Turned out they were believers. But nice. turn out to be, turn out to be, they were Catholics. Mm. Turn out to be that the older of the two is on a prayer chain. She goes, "There's over a hundred thousand on my email list, a prayer chain, and we all pray the Rosary, and we're nice. going to be praying for you." Nice. What is she going to do? She's on a email list of over a hundred thousand people, all of whom pray the Rosary, and we're going to pray for you. And I'm like, "Wow, what's going on here?" It's one. Second one. I go to this church because this church has the doors open during the daytime, during the week, and I would go and fall before the altar and pray because I'm desperate now. I'm facing this wicked, evil, satanic judge who destroys men and a godless ex-wife who doesn't care and wants to destroy me out of her rage, even though she did the damage. May God have mercy on all of us. Anyway, it's Sunday. So I want to go pray because I try to pray every day. Go before the Lord, before the altar, asking the Lord to protect my daughters and ask intercession of the saints. I forget it's Sunday and there's Mass. Okay? I forget. Now, I'm waiting for the service to finish so I can go by myself and pray. So I'm waiting. Now, before I tell you what happens, let me backtrack. At this church, there would be a Bible study on Thursdays. And the person who led the Bible study is Father Richard Simon. He's actually retired. He's a retired priest, but he has a show on Catholic relevant radio. Oh, nice. Relevant okay. Radio. It's uh, Father, is it Father si Father Knows Best? Anyway, Richard Simon. He does a daily show. He was the one who taught the Bible study Thursdays, and I love this man. Now, here's what's interesting about him. He was the part of the largest Catholic charismatic movement in America. He was one of the leaders. Mm -hmm where Catholics and evangelicals would come together and pray in tongues. He was part of that movement. Now, when I first saw him in the 90s, I go, aha, Jesuit spy, a plant. Someone sent him to infiltrate the charismatic movement to deceive people that Catholics pray in tongues too, in the right. spirit. <laughs> right. Yeah, so he was part of that movement. So I don't know if people know this or not. There are Catholics who believe that the Holy Spirit does give people the gift of praying in languages. In tongues because he's part of that movement the Catholic charismatic movement I don't know if all Catholics accept that or not but he was part of it so this man would teach the Bible study now that Thursday there was a lady there and I asked the question it was just a question right so now fast forward Sunday as I'm waiting for them to leave the lady that was there at the Bible study She's there with her husband and two sons. Now, as I'm standing there, her son, he's a teenager. He looks at me. He goes, are you Sam Shimon? I go, yeah. He started shaking. I'm not lying. It's like you saw a celebrity like Brad Pitt. I'm not lying. True story. Started shaking. He goes, oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. I go, take it easy, man. What's going on? He goes, man, you and David Wood, I watch you guys all the time. And the reason why is one of his best friends is a young Muslim, a teenager. And he goes, because of him, I went looking for answers and I found you. I cannot believe I'm seeing you face to face, Sam Shamoon. And he goes, in fact, I wasn't planning to coming to mass today. But something put in my heart to come. And here you are. Brother, would you meet with my Muslim friend? And I'm going to tell you what happened that. Now, his mother into, uh, comes in and says, oh, wow. Yeah, I knew there was something about you. I go, what do you mean? The way you asked the question told me you know your Bible. And I'm like blown away. How could you tell from a question that I know the Bible? 
and all glory to the Holy Spirit for everything good, right? She goes, I could tell by your the way you asked the question. I go, man, this guy knows his Bible. And this is her son who meets me. You know what she tells me when I tell her the story? Hmm. She goes, I'm a part of a group of intercessory prayer warriors, a group of women. And every Monday we devote ourselves to praying the rosary to intercede. You will now be part of this group. We are going to be praying for you and your daughters. Beautiful. Second, second, second time, second time that a woman who prays the rosary intercedes meets me and confirms she's going to be praying the rosary for me and for my daughters to intercede so the Lord intervenes. What's the odds of that? Very slim, but miraculous. Okay. Now let me tell you the good news about the young boy. He calls his friend and he meets me an hour later. I go, okay, I'll wait meet the young boy. He's a young Muslim man. He's probably 15, 16 like him. So I answer his questions about the Trinity. He's like, wow, those make sense. So then fast forward about a week or two later, the young man calls me because I gave him the number. And he says, my, my friend wants to meet you. Can we meet at the Starbucks? Because he has some more questions. So we meet at the Starbucks. When I'm done, you know what he says? The Muslim young boy. And mm -hmm. I hope he's growing in his faith because that young man will mentor him. He's a devout Catholic. His mother's a devout Catholic. So his father. The young Muslim boy told me, you know what? All my objections are answered. I have no objections against the Christian faith. I believe the Trinity. I believe Jesus is my God. Praise God. He confessed the Lord. That's beautiful. So these are some of the miracles that took place from 2017 where God is softening me. Enough is enough. When are you going to just give in? So then I decided, once again, let me be fair to the Assyrian church because that is the church of my ancestors. Let sure. me go back. Now, when I went back, I got attacked by some people with good intentions because it's condemned as an historian. Whereas the Catholics did not condemn me because the Catholics were telling me that now the Catholic Church is in partial communion, not full communion with the Assyrian Church, and recognizes that the label of historian is not <laughs> deserved because they don't believe that Christ is a divine person and a human person. But there are others who say, no, the language is such that though they may deny it, that's basically the logical conclusion of the terminology they use. Well, guess what? I'm in the hands of the Holy Spirit. I seek the face of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit keeps me in the Assyrian church and shows me that's not the case, his will be done. But if the Holy Spirit shows me, no, you need to move on, his will be done. Because my allegiance isn't to men or an organization. I want to yield to the Holy Spirit and accept the fullness of the truth. So my journey hasn't ended, especially when I affirm the title Theotokos, which, by the way, we have some here who go to the Assyrian Church of the East, Sargandi, if he's still here, or Thomas. And if I tell them, do you believe Mary is Theotokos, Mother of God? Absolutely. I was at a Bible study, Assyrian Church, and I told the people, do you believe that when Mary conceived that baby, Jesus in her womb, that he was still God? Yes. Was he fully God? Yes. Did he stop being God in the womb? No. Did he become a second person? No. And when she gave birth to that baby, that male baby, was that God being born as a babe? Yes. So did she carry God for nine months? Yes. Well, you just affirmed Theotokos, even though officially that title is rejected. The title, basically. yeah. So this probably will land me in trouble, but I don't care. I will affirm Theotokos. So if they want me to leave, God bless them. I'll never attack the Eastern Church if they have me leave or bar me. I won't attack them. I won't. Because this church has given up hundreds of thousands of martyrs murdered by Persians, murdered by Turks, murdered by Muslims because they love and worship the triune God. And the average Assyrian doesn't know what Nestorian is or Nestorianism. And do not think there are two persons. So just want to be clear on that. Yeah, the Catholic Church, I think, signed a joint declaration yes, with the Church of the East. Yeah, I think under John Paul II. And uh, they said that a lot of these misunderstandings were ling linguistic and cultural in nature. Yeah. But you know what? I've heard people say, well, because these popes are liberal and they'll bend over backwards. You see, so it, it, once you made up your position, no answer will suffice. But like I said, if I can be shown, proven, and I'm not here to say, no, I won't, that the terms used in Aramaic do posit a divine person, a human person, then I can't accept it. Just like I don't reject Theotokos. I affirm the title Theotokos, which again is not something that's part of the official teaching of the Syrian church.
So we'll see where the Lord brings me as I continue my journey. But that's my journey, brother. It's absolutely fantastic, man. It just blows me away. It, it the providence of God, how it works, and how we, the you know the people and circumstances that He uses, the golden thread that He weaves throughout um, to bring you to where He wants you. And then you look at the time; it doesn't make sense. But looking back, hindsight twenty twenty, you could see, oh, that's why this happened, or that's why this person came into my life. It's just, uh, it's stunning. And what's amazing, brother. James White has been used by the child God in spite of himself to lead more people out of Protestantism and Calvinism and into the ancient apostolic churches. You believe that? I do believe it. Yeah. And that's God not his a, goal. Right, right. God has a sense of humor, though. Right? Funny. And he hates it when you say that. Did you hear the man testimony that I gave you? He goes, he started watching the debates with Robert St. James, James White. And where did he end up? In an ancient apostolic church. Incredible. But James White, in his arrogance, pride, thinks he's God's gift to the church, and he doesn't know that's his downfall. And God is taking his evil to bring about a greater good. May he repent before it's too late. Amen. Nobody's nobody's lost no. until their last breath. We can always pray. We can pray for their souls. Everybody has a certain degree of culpability, of knowledge, so we leave it to the merciful hands of God. Um, and so let me ask you this, Sam. What were some of the most difficult uh, objections to overcome? So some, some of the most difficult doctrines to wrestle with that you had? I would say the bodily assumption of Mary is something that's very difficult because I haven't been able to dig deep enough into it, but I have no doubt that <clears throat> this is something that is in the realm of what God can and has done. I just need to study that because the argument is that the evidence for the assumption is very scanty and there's not enough early evidence. And it didn't help, by the way. And I say this because not every Catholic apologist is equipped like William Albrecht in this area. I watched a debate with Robert Sengenis and James White and others on this topic. And Sengenis basically concedes. And I'm not saying he's right because William says, no, there is evidence. And I'm, and I, by the way, I affirmed the bodily assumption. I don't have no problem with it. Right, right. The problem is, the problem is I don't have the evidence that would silence a naysayer because I have not studied. I'm not well learned, but I'm going to rectify that if the Lord is pleased and the Holy Spirit gives me life and holiness. So I affirm it. That's why I'm going to be celebrating the assumption on August 15th to Praise the chagrin of many Protestants and think. And by the way, brethren, do pray for me. God will preserve me. I'm losing support because of this. And I'm in full-time ministry and God sustained me and never to prostitute myself for fame or money. But I have two daughters that I want to provide for. So pray God will sustain me because this is being used by my detractors to get people to start supporting me, knowing that I'm in full-time ministry. But the Lord's will be done. Yeah, and I put that in the description that this is costing you not only friendships, but potential support. So oh, yeah. I people encourage... Are... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I encourage everyone to go to your channel, which is Shamunian on YouTube, and, and support you in any way that they can. Uh, you definitely need it. You deserve it. Your daughters need it as well. Yeah. Um, so um, how much it time do you have? Something that I need to study. And William has done some excellent research. I just haven't had the time to get around it. And another thing, two other things that are difficult in this Orthodox Catholic divide. The papacy and purgatory. These are two things that I need to study to equate myself with, to be familiar with the evidence and so I can make an informed decision, right? Because right. if the Lord has me leave the Assyrian Church due to my differences in theology, because I, I love the Assyrian Church. I don't want the Assyrians to think I'm a, no, I will never attack. But what I'm saying is I can't lie to them. I can't right. put on a facade and be something I'm not. I affirm Theotokos. She's a mother of God. That in itself would not be accepted by the clergy who know. They would say no. It's Christus Tokus. I'd say, no, it's Theotokos. So that's going to get me in trouble right there because I can't. The Bible is clear. She's the mother of God. And you'll find statements of fathers, even Ephraim the Syrian and others, before the Council of Ephesus that affirm this title, Theotokos. Right. Mother of God. Right. So I can't back down. I can't compromise. I can't just say, no, I'll go with Christotokos because I don't want to tickle ears and I don't want to prostitute myself. I want to be a man of integrity. So point being is that the issue of the papacy is the evidence, ancient and overwhelming, that though all these bishops had jurisdiction over their respective see, the Pope was recognized due to the fact 
that of his not only location, but because he, in a unique sense, sits on the seat of Peter, he's the head of the church on earth. I need to study that. Purgatory, I need to study. I know that there are even Protestants who accept the form of purgatory. Yeah. C.S. Lewis did. There's right. Jerry Walls, a Protestant who hates Calvinism. Can't stand it. Thinks it's a biblical perversion, and I agree. He believes there is postmortem purgation. And I've been told that even the Orthodox have a form of purgatory called toll houses, but I don't know because I'm still learning. That's why I'm saying I'm still on a journey. We'll see where the Spirit takes me. Praise God. Hey, uh, how much time do you have? Man, I, dude, I'm all about myself and my cat. Hey, one of the um, interesting things that I've uh, been watching on your channel lately that I've immensely enjoyed is the Eucharist as a sacrifice. Yeah. Now, it might shock some people to know that the early church believed not only was the Eucharist the real body and blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord, but it was also for the remission of sins and immortality. Yeah. Um, would you mind giving a little, uh, uh, in a nutshell, a short exposition yes. about how can that be if Christ's sacrifice is once for all on the cross? How can that be propitiatory? Yes, the because that sacrifice of Christ on the cross is being presented to the Father. It's not Christ being crucified over and over again. You may have some people who think that is, but that's not it. That's not the belief of the ancient churches, nor is it the belief of the Catholic or the Orthodox Church. It's not you're crucifying Christ over and over again. It's that when Christ died once and for all, he makes that physical sacrifice available for us to then offer to the Father over and over again that one sacrifice for the sins we commit after baptism. And not only for the sins we commit, but also for our healing, because it's our medicine and our spiritual nourishment. Now, what got me to accept that view? Well, it'd be shocking how I came to this view. As I said in one of my streams, I was trying to respond to a liberal. He's not even a Christian. I don't know why they call him Christian. His name is James McGrath. He's a liberal who believes the Bible is historically inaccurate, full of errors, contradictions, and that the historical Jesus did not really claim to be God and may have not actually been raised physically. So why is he still claiming the label Christian? Why is he teaching in a seminary? And I believe he's Wesleyan. James McGrath. I don't know. His professor was the late James D.G. Dunn, another liberal oh. that people think he's conservative. I don't consider him conservative. But anyway, in this book, he says that the defining act of worship, that which was worship in the highest sense, to be given to God alone, this is in his book, is sacrifice. And he quotes Jewish sources and pagan sources to show that the key defining act of worship, the highest form of worship given to someone who is truly deity is sacrifice. You don't sacrifice to someone who's not deity. You don't sacrifice to a mere mortal or angels. Sacrifice is to be given only to someone who is truly divine and in the Jewish context only to the true God. The reason why he argued that is to show that Jesus, though may have been considered divine, he wasn't considered divine in the same sense that the Father is because sacrifices were not offered to him, only to the Father. So you understand his argument? Yeah. So because of that argument, I said, I got to destroy his, his case. So guess what I did? I tried to examine the New Testament and see what others have said. Is there any indication... That in New Testament, sacrifices are offered to the Lord. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 22. And 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 22. And so let me speak loud. Let's see if my cat's coming. Mm. And 1 Corinthians 10. Brother, in fact, if you can, would you mind reading 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 22? Let me just pull it up on my phone here. Yeah, as I try. Because the poor cat's going to get drowned in the rain. Come on, kid. You dirty kid. First Corinthians 7, 14 to 22. Okay. Therefore, my dear friends, free from idolatry, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. 
Consider the people of Israel. Do not, do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean Pause that? for a second, brother. Notice that the Lord's table, the mm -hmm. word Lord's table, is likened to the sacrifices of the Israelites offered at the altar in the temple. And then it's going to be likened to the animal sacrifices that the pagans offer to their idols in the temple. Right. What's being likened to these sacrifices? The Lord's table, meaning the bread and the cup, right? Right. Now keep reading. To 22. Uh, do I mean that food sacrifice to an idol is anything or that a, an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now let's unpack this. This passage troubled me because even during the time, which was like maybe four or five years ago, maybe six, when I was no longer anti-Catholic, but I still don't want to be Catholic, and I still don't want to accept the Eucharist as the flesh and blood of Christ. When I read this, this bothered me. Why? Because the bread and the cup, which Paul says are the body and blood of Christ, is likened to the sacrifices of the Israelites on the altar in the temple. Those were actual physical sacrifices, animal, physical. And it's likened to the animal sacrifices that the pagans would offer to their gods and goddesses in their temple. But I had a problem with that. I didn't believe the bread and the cup were the actual physical sacrifice of Christ. They were symbols. Why then is the bread and the cup being <clears throat> sandwiched and likened to actual physical sacrifices given by the Jews on one hand to the true God, on the altar in the temple, and then given by the pagans to their false gods in their temples, because though he says an idol is nothing, but behind an idol is an actual evil spiritual presence, demons. So when you offer an animal sacrifice to Zeus, it's not to Zeus, it's to the devil or a demon that's acting as if he is Zeus. Correct. So that bothered me, because then that means if I'm going to be consistent and fair to Scripture, then the bread and the cup are not merely symbols. They are that physical sacrifice of Christ that we offer. Otherwise, the analogy fails. How is it mm -hmm. likened to, and why is it being sandwiched with actual physical animal sacrifice in one hand that the Jews offer to the true God and with the pagans on the other hand? Because you know and I, you and I both know that the pagans believe that you needed to appease the gods and goddesses and get them to do favors for you by offering them actual animal sacrifices and blood libation. Mm -hmm. In fact, even human sacrifices, like in the case of Homer's, was it Iliad? Where when they went out to war against, what's the man? I've, they even made a movie about it. Brad Pitt played uh, Achilles. I can't remember. Uh, what was the name of that place when they attacked it? Homer's Troy. Name. Troy! Good guess. What did I just guessed. To do? What did the, the goddess demand of him to attack and defeat Troy? Sacrifice his daughter. Mm. Says, if you want to win, you're going to have to sacrifice your daughter. And he slit her throat as a sacrifice to the goddess. I forget which goddess. But see, the pagans offered actual physical sacrifices. And sadly, sometimes human sacrifices. Because this is the way they appease the gods and get the gods to do their bidding. So if Jesus' Jesus's sacrifice that he offered on the cross is not what we offer at the Lord's table when we take the bread and the wine, then why is it being likened to the animal sacrifices to the Jews and the animal sacrifices of the pagans? That bothered me, but I still didn't want to accept it. But here's where it got even worse. Paul alludes to the language of Malachi 1, 6 to 14. In Malachi 1, 6 to 14, there it talks about offering a defective animal sacrifice at the Lord's table. It's the same language. If you look at the Greek version of the Old Testament, Malachi 1, 6 to 14, mm -hmm. and compare it with the Greek of Paul, he uses the same Greek words, Lord's table. There in Malachi 1, 6 to 14, it's referring to the altar of Jehovah, the Lord's table, which is now being applied to the table of the Lord Jesus where his sacrifice is being presented. It's a direct allusion to Malachi 1, 6 to 14. You're going to see why that's significant in a minute. 
But let me add other testimonies. I then found that the Didache in Zechariah uh, chapter 14, I'm sorry, the Didache, Didache in chapter 14, and fathers like Justin Martyr saying that the Eucharist is the fulfillment of Malachi 1, 10 to 11. Yeah, right back to the Didache. So now it bothered me. Now, for those of you who don't know, maybe, I don't know, can you access the Didache on, online? Let me see. Yeah, if it's online on newadvent.org, and if you read chapter 14. Okay, here's a Didache. Chapter 14. Chapter 14. Let me just scroll. Chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 14. Here we go. But every Lord's Day, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanksgiving after having confessed your transgressions, that your sacrifice may be pure. But let no one that is at variance with his fellow come together with you until they be reconciled, that your sacrifice may be not profaned. For this is that which was spoken by the Lord, and every, every place and every time offered to me a pure sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is wonderful among the nations or Gentiles. Now notice the Didache. For those of you who don't know, by the way, they're saying there's a troll here who's trolling and distracting named Bob. Yeah, he's an Islamic convert, I think. Okay, well, yeah, they just they were trying to get your attention just know. But now let's break down uh, Didache. Didache, guys, for those who don't know the teaching, the evidence shows it's a first century manual, a document written perhaps in the middle or latter part of the first century during the time when the apostles are still alive to the apostolic churches. And it's a manual telling Christians what to do and what not to do, the virtues, good deeds to cultivate, and the sins to avoid, and how to worship. So it tells you, on the Lord's Day, this is what you do. In fact, it's in this manual that abortion is condemned as murder. Right? I believe it's in chapter 2. And pedophilia or pederasty is condemned. Chapter 2 and chapter 3. But here in chapter 14, it says that on the Lord's Day, Sunday, Christians gather to break bread, but you must confess your sins and have no grudges against the brother in order not to defile your pure sacrifice. And then it says this Eucharist, this bread, fulfills Malachi 1, verses 10 all the way to 14, where it says, From the east and the west, the Gentiles will offer to me a pure sacrifice. Now that really bothered me. This is where it bothered me. Mm -hmm. According to the unanimous teaching of the church from the time of the apostles, the Didache is from the time of the apostles, so we're into the apostolic churches and onward. In fact, the word sacrifice in here it's thusia, it's it's a word for it's the Greek word thusia, meaning sacrifice. All Christians taught that the Eucharist fulfills Malachi, specifically 10 to 11, where God said. I will no longer accept a sacrifice from the hands of the Levitical priests. I'm done with you. So he's saying, I'm going to replace you. Instead, people from the rising of the sun to its setting will offer to me a pure sacrifice. And the Christian said, that's the Eucharist. Because all over the world, Gentiles who have now converted and believe in Jesus Christ our Lord are offering the Eucharist as that pure sacrifice fulfilling Malachi 1. How if the bread and the cup is not the actual physical sacrifice of Christ? That's what mm. bothered. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing too is the change in the priesthood. The the Levitical is is now it's passe. But what yep. is re, what is re-inaugurated and fulfilled is the Melchizedekian priesthood. And as as you recall, the sacrifice of Melchizedek was bread and wine. Bread and wine, Genesis 14, 18 to 20, which he gave to Abraham. That's right. See? So this is where it bothered me. And for years, you know what I did with that information? Hmm. Suppressed it. But it was there. Remember, it doesn't leave you. I was troubled because I went to refute him. But what I intended was one thing. What God intended was for me to discover this. That's I got trouble. I'm being honest. I got troubled because I was trying to respond to him. I wasn't looking for evidence that it's the actual physical sacrifice of Christ. But I got troubled. I go, how is this God. possible? Praise and God. I suppressed it, brother. I suppressed it. And I tried to then explain it logically. Well, my mind cannot accept that. It's the physical. I came up with a thousand one arguments. Then finally I said, why am I fighting? Yeah. What's Honestly, let's be realistic. What do you have to lose by accepting 
the overwhelming biblical, textual, historical, archaeological facts that all point in this direction over against what the later reformers taught. What do you have to lose? Well, you have a lot to lose if it's true and you deny it because you're not in union with the Lord, but you have everything to gain. Amen. See, so I got bothered. This is what bothered me. And then I said, enough is enough. And it's ironic that Martin Luther himself would say, this is the flesh and the blood of Christ, though he may not have described it in the same way as transubstantiation. And then he had a debate with, was it Zwingli? You were Zwingli? He yeah. said, no, he, he actually argued for the symbolic view. And then comes Calvin and argues for the spiritual view, the spiritual presence, what that means. Because Christ is always spiritually present, right? <clears throat> In every act of worship in the church. So what do you mean spiritual presence? It's anything just to get away from the Catholic Church and to attack the Catholic Church and to demonize the Catholic Church. And yet Protestantism hasn't come up with something better because depending on which Protestant denomination you belong to, if you become Lutheran, you're going to believe in the real presence of Christ, that it is the flesh and blood of Christ. Even Anglicans, right, especially high church Anglicans, they believe mm -hmm. that. And they believe in infant water baptism or generation. But if you end up becoming a Calvinist, what kind of Calvinist? Reformed Baptist that would have been condemned by John Calvin as fake? Now, you're not really Reformed. You're more Anabaptist. But put that aside. Reformed Baptist that it's symbolic and that you only administer baptism to those who confess and repent? Or are you going to be a Presbyterian who believes in infant baptism, though it doesn't regenerate, it's a sign of the covenant, and believe that Christ is truly spiritually present at the Eucharist? You see, it's mishmash. Mm -hmm. And in your lifetime as a Protestant, you can go from one view to the next. You can start as a Baptist, who holds a symbolic view of the Eucharist and credo baptism, end up becoming a Presbyterian, as many do, and then believe in infant baptism, as a sign of the covenant and believe that the Eucharist is not just symbolic, that Christ is really present in a spiritual way, spiritual presence. You see, it's mishmash. Hmm. Yeah, better just to go with the unanimous consent of the fathers. Um, if anyone if anyone wants a great exposition on the Eucharist and all the ways that Sam and I just mentioned and more, uh, go to St. John of Damascus, an exposition of the Orthodox faith. Um, there is a beautiful treatise on the Eucharist in that in that work. Glory to God. Well, the Son and John of Damascus, John Damascene, also destroyed Islam. He wrote tracts destroying Islam and yeah. Muhammad as a fraud. Contemporary of, of Islam, yeah. Yep, he was he was in the he was under I, I believe working for the caliph in Syria in the 700s and he wrote a tract showing why Muslims are mutilators and Muhammad is a madman. In fact, John of Damascus taught that Islam is a Christian heresy. That's right. For those of you who don't know, you can read his track, Attacking Islam Online for free. It's translated. He said that Muhammad was actually trained by an Aryan monk or priest, that it's a form of Arianism, the belief of Arius, that Jesus is a creature, but he's also divine to some extent, not merely human. So he labeled it, labeled it as an Arian heresy a heresy akin to Arius' belief about Jesus. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, su supernatural in the sense that, you know, God said to him, like Adam, be, and he was, and he began to be conceived in the womb of the virgin. So miraculous in that sense, but nonetheless still a mere human, a mere mortal. So there you go, folks. John of Damascus is a blessing to the church. And isn't it true that, that as far as East and West is concerned, would he be labeled the last, Church father by both? Yeah, that's five? that's pretty much like the normal consensus that he's the last of the church fathers. But a great, great, mighty, spirit filled, holy slave of Christ. May we walk like them and be worthy of their company for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. But there you go. Amen. That's well, my brother, story, brother. Now, with your permission, could I upload this later? Oh, please do. I would I would be honored and blessed if you would do that. You, um, so yeah, guys, uh, if you help me get to 2000 subs, I will give away a free book. So all you have to do when I drop that video, it'll just be titled book giveaway or something. I'll leave the comment section open. So just comment. I'll pick one of you after a week, two weeks. Uh, I'll send you my email address in the comments. We can correspond. Give me your address. If you live in the States or Canada, send you a free book. Not sure which one yet, but it'll be a, a doozy. I promise. Um, and like, like I said, if you go to smartcatholics.com slash Dustin quick, 
You can read a little bio about me, see my conversion story in uh, condensed form with an interview. And you can also go to courses and view my Hebrew Origins of Catholicism course. It's 12 videos, and you'll most definitely enjoy that. Make sure you subscribe to Sam's channel, Shemunian, on YouTube. Support him, support his ministry for, this, for his sake and for his blessed daughter's sake. In Jesus' name, please support him. Glory to God. Praise the Lord, brother. Now, brother, if you have any questions or they have questions, I can take them. But that's pretty much my testimony in a nutshell. That's perfect. We just ran up on two hours. Uh, oh. Somebody said, I need a mod for the chat. To be honest, I don't even know how to how do you how do you get a mod? Like, how do you do that? Well, it's very easy. You're on YouTube, right? Go to your yeah. YouTube. When you see the name, when you put your cursor to the name of the person, you see three dots. OK, click on it. It will tell you you can remove them or add them as a mod. Okay. Pro -like choice. She's an amazing sister who's a mod for William and I and other channels. She loves Jesus Christ. I'd make her a mod. She's solid. You said pro life choice. Yeah, she's right there in your comments. Okay, I see oh, pro life Chloe. I'm sorry, pro life Chloe. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Pro, pro life Chloe. My my apologies, Chloe. Uh, I'll click on the three dots right now. If and it'll will... say add as a mod. Okay, let me do that right now. Where'd she go? There she is. It keeps bumping up because people are chatting. Okay. Uh, you can, yeah, just scroll it up and it'll stop. All I show is put user in timeout or block user. No, actually, it should tell you that if it's your channel, you're, it should say also add mod. It should tell you that if you're on your YouTube channel. Not on StreamYard. You got to go on Oh, YouTube. not on StreamYard. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Let you me. Go uh, to you got to go to the actual YouTube channel and go there. That's where it gives you that option. Not on StreamYard. Okay, so here we go. Uh, add moderator. There you go. And, y you know, you got also a couple other solid brothers and sisters. You need at least two or three good ones. Another good one is Catholic Crusader Deuce Vault. Yeah, I might I might add uh, them. And also, if you're still watching, hallelujah. If you want to um, be a mod, I'd love to have you. I know you're on a couple other channels, Reason and Theology and Meaning of Catholic. But if you'd like to do my channel, I'd be honored. So uh, yeah. just let me know. Yeah, so there you go. They'll help you now. When trolls come in and they mock or distract, they can then block them and they won't bother you anymore. But glory to God. Uh, I'm excited to upload this because not only will people hear my story more thoroughly because I've given details I haven't given elsewhere, right. but it will bring traffic to your channel. And we want more subscribers for you for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let me just uh, close out the show then by saying you've been watching Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was episode 78, From Anti-Catholicism to Apostolic Christianity, with my dear friend and brother in Christ, Sam Shamoon. Hope you guys have a blessed night. Stay safe, and God love you. I'm going to end the broadcast in three, two, one.